Music. A matter of life and death. The poet Anne Bradstreet emigrated to the US at the end of the 17th century. She wrote a poem to my dear grandchild Simon, who died the 16th of November, 1669, being but a month and one day old. No sooner came, but gone, and fallen asleep. Acquaintance short, yet parting caused us weep. Any piece of music begins from silence, is there for a moment, and then is gone. I think we can all relate to that. As I write this, there is a drama outside my window, in the Victorian apartment block opposite. First of all, a fire officer responding to a query about a locked flat and smoke. Then an ambulance crew cannot get a response. Things escalate, and they try and get through the, it proves, sturdy window frames and door. A moment of comedy as a paramedic tries to push through a gap in the window, gets stuck and is rescued. Neighbours hang over the balconies. Then the police arrive with notebooks and radios, but nothing useful, until two serious officers with beards and a battering ram 
take out the door and the window. Glass shatters, wood splinters, and the medics clamber in, and there's a flurry of chatter on the radios, and then a lull. Shoulders sag and the equipment is put to one side. There's nothing to do but fill in forms. Pull what is left of the curtains over the ragged gap, where once there was an elegant window, and wait for the black undertaker's van to arrive. A pole settles over the cul-de-sac. People go back to their tea. Officers drift away. And by this afternoon there will just be boards across the empty window space, in lieu of that life. The second piece Michael Hirsch wrote for me in 2008, 14 pieces, was woven around a series of quotes from poems by Premier Levy. Till the time that I received it, Michael and I had not had any conversation about writing, about poetry, or even about art, nor by extension how vital for us as artists, as musicians, as people, such reaching out to the other arts is. I came to realise that we both fail, if you like, to acknowledge any divide between the various ways humans express themselves and look mortality in the face, and the beauty that is to be found there, for there's going to be a certain amount of Shakespeare today, in the shade of death I shall find joy. That's from Henry VI, part two. Of course, for anyone, but perhaps most particularly for our generation, the very mention of Prima Levi evokes so much. As I write this, I can turn to the bookshelves right behind me and reach out to the row of titles with me since I was a teenager. From the periodic table, right up to the wrench, Levi's visions and reportage, horrific and joy-filled in gyre-like counterpoints of past, present and future, were part of our vernacular growing up. So the idea of using his words comes heavily laden, freighted, fraught. So it was at this moment, with this piece, the mortality first found its way into my conversations with Hirsch. Which is to say, of course, that at this moment we started to really talk. After all, the very English pleasantries around teacups and lazy tabletops eschews the real subjects which unite us all and eventually divide us. They are just talk empty noise. Back then, most of our conversations took place by fax. Some of those faxes are taped into my working copies of this music. They, like the psalmist's grass, curl and wither, the text fading. Soon they will be blank. I have made copies. I feel strongly that such fragility, friability, is a necessary part of what art does. His. Jean-Louis Gouet de Balzac, in conversation with Catherine de Vivant, the Marquise de Rambouillet, wrote, Even all that that is written down is not certain to survive, and books perish, just as tradition is forgotten. Time, which can conquer iron and marble, does not lack strength against more fragile things. 
mortality is vital to the stuff of art, as well as its essence. In my experience, unlike many composers who use unsung or unheard text in their music, Hirsch does not allow the poetic text onto the musical material itself. He nearly always places text on pages which interleave the musical material, and, because Michael always chooses most carefully highly concentrated reductions from the texts which have inspired him, these interstices have a life of their own. And once we give them attention can, and sometimes do, demand supremacy over the accompanying musical texts. Each interstatus, the etymology of interstice, demands primacy. And, most importantly, the silences between movements where these texts happen are not heard, not voiced. Michael forbade me from reading them out. But they pass before the performer's eye as they turn the page.
The sixth movement of Michael Hirsch's 14 pieces includes the following text. I won't go far. Just to the other shore, I want to observe at close hand that dark cloud and find the source of this strange light. Quick, get the boat ready. It is already night. Of course, I'll come back quickly. As soon as I read this, I recognised it, and a small light went on in my mind as I played Hirsch's movement for the first time. A personal reading floated into my mind. I will take the boat. Over there. To the other side. Visit the apocalypse, just to see what it's like. I will only be a little while. Of course, my reading, my dance between Levy's text and Hirsch's music, immediately portrays the neuroses of my nationality. First of all, there are the echoes of the celebrated suicide of Captain Scott, Comrade Lawrence Oates, whose stoic final words for his frozen friends in their Antarctic tent are burnt into the minds of every boy of my age. I'm just going outside, and maybe some time. What immediately struck me, as it would strike anybody else educated in the almost dead classical tradition of Latin and ancient Greek, was that Levy is speaking the words of someone else. That person was also reporting the words of another, close to their death. Pliny the Younger described his uncle's curiosity leading to his demise at the eruption of Vesuvius on August the 24th, AD 79. I realise that that is today, and a shiver briefly passes through me. On the 24th of August, in the early afternoon, my mother drew his attention to a cloud of unusual size and appearance. He clambered up to a place which would give him the best view of the phenomenon. He gave orders for the ships to be launched. He hurried to the place which everyone else was leaving, steering his course straight for the danger zone. The power of the most original things that we do is that they are shared. I play Michael's music, sing and speak, if you like, with his voice, where his drab, his finery. He converses with Levy. Levy remembers the young Pliny, who describes his uncle, whilst regretting his own careless nonchalance at the world's end. He went on with his homework, while all hell was let loose across the Bay of Naples. And that was Pliny's voice I recognised first, where the first new link was forged my personal typology leading in and out from the music was this. In this way, things are shared, exchanged. Even my prejudice, my miseducation, which adds layers of calcite, sediment to the texts, might also even serve to chip away at the mudstone, revealing a flash of quartzite, maybe a hidden geode, a world within, or just pyrites. Fool's gold lurking beneath. But Michael's music, his wild imaginings, weave a circle around him thrice, beware, beware, sets me off on more hare-brained huntings. After a moment with Virgil and Purcellian suicide, to the imminent catastrophe, which has always been the fear of artists. But should I not return? Remember me. Remember me. Remember that this crust on which we teeter, we totter, is only eggshell thin, that beneath it and just below us the raging seas, lava and magma dance, and should, or rather when they choose to consume us, there will be nothing left of all that we have made, not so much as a wishbone, let alone a cornerstone. So on this assurance of death in life, of the wild geological rumpus dance beneath us, the beautiful threat of outer space just a few miles above our heads, the bacteria that play craps with our lifespan, as we all know far too well, not to mention our own propensity to accelerate our own destruction. Between all these, or maybe despite all this, Scylla and Charybdis, devil in the deep blue sea, the many rocks and hard places, Despite all this, amongst all this, we find the need to sing, to tell stories, to paint, to build, to live and to love, all of which life is bracketed by birth and life, so we sing. But of what shall we sing? It is perhaps surprising that we choose to sing of our own destruction, to tempt the fate which we cannot avoid, poke the bear, tease the lion, 
climbed the volcano. But it seems that any of those things, our dancing, our painting, our singing, is built in the dark places. Here we have to go, to dig, to delve, to find that beauty. All of Hirsch's music finds safe harbour in such headlands and sable imaginings. Studying the Levy pieces reminded me of the very end of W.G. Zabel's last book, Rings of Saturn, where he remembered a passage in Sir Thomas Brown's Pseudoxia Epidemica that I can no longer find, that in the Holland of his time, the 17th century, where I began my little talk, it was customary in a home where there had been a death to drape black mourning ribbons over all the mirrors and canvases depicting landscapes or people or the fruits of the field, so that the soul as it left the body would not be distracted on its final journey, either by a reflection of itself or by a last glimpse of the land now being lost for ever. Outside, the ritual of death across my street is entering its next stage. A young relative has been found by the very gentle police. I can't believe it, and is comforted on the steps of an ambulance. Forms are being filled in, in every direction, and a hush has settled, as the colours change from the high-vis greens of emergency vehicles to the careful formality and hat-adjusting of law enforcement. The black and white as they await the darker vehicle that cadences the morning's drama.
When I came to study and play, the process did take a year, Hirsch's epic Zwischen Leben und Tod for violin and piano, I discovered that Zebald had been in Hirsch's mind too. And the same kind of layering I described earlier had happened as Hirsch built a deep conversation with the artwork of Peter Weiss. Zebald was Hirsch's guide to Weiss. Hirsch quoted Zebald describing the Weiss artwork which inspired, it's a very crude word for a complex relationship, the music that you just heard. A pandemonium of transgression in front of a background of capsizing ships and now a permanent state of destruction. Another journey to the abyss creeps into my mind. Zebald is guiding Hirsch, just as Virgil took Dante's hand and led him through the inferno, and the music, like the poetry, marks the journey in and out of the abyss of the inferno. By another path thou needs must go, if thou wilt ever leave this waste. In 2010, quite out of the blue, Hirsch sent me a new work for violin alone. In the snowy margins is a seven movement suite. The performance directions for the last two movements offer an insight into the two polarities of Michael's expressive language, his imagination, his gamut. The penultimate movement is marked terrifying, cataclysmic, and the last, grieving throughout, never rushing. Lurking behind all this is the question of destruction, even of ruin. A few days ago, I took the train 80 miles north from London to the Fens, the flat marshlands of Cambridgeshire. There, the great Romanesque Abbey Cathedral of Ely looms out of the mists, dwarfing the little town of no more than 1,200 clustered at its feet. The cathedral was begun in the late 10 hundreds and mostly finished by the end of the 12th century. However, in the early 13 hundreds, it was decided to build a lady chapel a few metres to the north, mainly to keep the many female pilgrims away from the monks who thronged the main buildings. On the 22nd of February, 1322, quite an easy date to remember, work on the foundations of this new chapel caused the central tower of the main church to completely collapse. new building rose from the destruction, an octagonal central tower, the Lantern, one of the great masterpieces of all medieval architecture, complete with doorways high up so that choruses could literally sing from heaven. And the cause of all this tumult and rebuilding, the Lady Chapel, was completed in the 1350s, with a glorious fan-vaulted roof, 
and encrusted with hundreds of sculptures, a masterpiece of the white cutter's art. Two hundred years later, though, the English Reformation swept through the monastic communities. First of all, King Henry VIII stripped the church of its ornaments and riches, right down to the lead on the roofs. A problem that arises every time that times are hard. It's happening now. And then his heir, the embittered boy King Edward VI, angry that there was no more riches to take, unleashed a maelstrom of iconoclasm, vandalism, on the work of the medieval carvers and architects. The head of every single statuette in the Lady Chapel was lopped off, every full-size figure toppled from its apse or niche. Nothing human remains, save the grinning roof bosses, far too high in the fan vaults for the hammers and grappling irons of Edward's goons. As I stood in this chapel, the last movement of Michael Hirsch's Of Sorrow Born started to drift through my mind. I walked along the apses and bays of this still astonishing building and realised that what had not been smashed were representations of nature. Trees, leaves, flowers, rocks, water. No human figure or face survived, but life found a way. Michael Hirsch's finale, which seemed and seems to fit so well with the atmosphere of this space, is, he notes, a setting of Orlando Gibbons's choral work, O Lord, I Lift My Heart to Thee. This was written in 1614, just as the murderous fires of the English Reformation and Counter-Reformations were about to be replaced by civil war. Gibbons had set Psalm 25, which includes in the 1662 version the line, Mine eyes are ever looking unto the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. The pianist Roderick Chadwick, who you just heard, noted when he heard the piece and saw my film of the destruction of the chapel decorations, think how many people would have sung and loved Gibbons in that chapel. But, just as the Gibbons was being written at the beginning of the 1600s, collapse and ruin visited the cathedral again. The huge, towered northwest corner, the Galilee porch, fell. It was never replaced. Instead, a vast, sloping buttress was erected amongst the still ragged remains of dog-toothed Norman arches and arcades, a counterweight against the rest of the building falling too. So far, so good, it has not. Looking at the arches, the line of Frederico Garcia Lorca drifts into my mind. Los arcos rotos donde sufre el tiempo. The broken arches where time suffers. All of our art is made in the context of destruction, rebuilding, and further ruin. Perhaps it depends on it. Without all of it, Nothing can happen, or ever has happened.
On the most basic level, music plays with life and death in one very simple aspect. It isn't there until it happens, is happening. And to a greater or lesser degree, composers recognise this in how they make music, how they practice. This is also fundamental to the very essence of music itself. It is alive when it is happening, being made, being heard, being shared, and not when it is not. Silence is death. This market is curiously not always observed. Of course, its essence is always subject to disagreement, to review, to interpretation. T.S. Eliot wrote, Words move, music moves only in time, but that which is only living can only die. Only by the form, the pattern, can words or music reach the stillness, as a Chinese jar still moves perpetually in its stillness. I think that one might argue that the very essence of what we have come to call classical music, which is at best an unhelpful moniker, is its closeness to silence as one of its two vital integers, sound and silence, life and death. Silence in the making of music is in every way rest. Seen thus, heard thus, we might argue that sound in the making of music is the opposite of rest. Activity, work, lovemaking, war, any doing, any verb. And thus we might revisit, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. The flights of angels is us, in motion, breathing, loving, living. Which reminds me of two things vital for music, art and poetry. Firstly, Keats pointed out that he, at least if not we, for many a time I have been half in love with easeful death called him soft names in many a mused rhyme, to take into the air my quiet breath. Now, more than ever, seems it rich to die. And the second of all, that rest, the silence, lies on both sides, ensconces this thing that we call life. That silence, not being, which is also death, is the moment, the eternity, it doesn't matter which, before which we, I, you, happen, are happening right now. Shakespeare again, from Much Ado About Nothing. Silence is the perfectest herald of joy. And that joy, life itself, is at once fleeting and blinding. In 1914, the poet Rupert Brooke, marching down to the sea at Dover, to the war from which he would never return, wrote in a letter to his aunt. Old ladies waved handkerchiefs, young ladies gave us apples, and old men and children cheered, and we cheered back, and I felt very elderly and sombre, and full of thought of how human life was a flash between darknesses. This was his moment of existential realisation, where the action, the revelation and the experience were one and the same thing. This is the very essence of music, and it is not possible without silence, as life is not possible without death. 